Het cortege. Mag ik u verzoeken te gaan staan? We open this ceremony with this little prayer. Can I ask the colleagues to take off their caps? May the spirit of wisdom and mercy grow and blossom in all of us. Please be seated, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you at the occasion of this 89th DS Natalis of Tilburg University. A special welcome to our external guests, Sally Wyatt, Professor George Lewinstein, and Professor William Kingsbury. To my friends, the mayors of the city of Tilburg and then Bos. To our business relations, to the members of uh, the supervisory board, welcome again. To all my colleagues sitting just in front of me, and that feels very good, ladies and gentlemen. To the teachers, to the support staff, to the students, looking fashionable as always, but also a little bit late in terms of the timing. And then, of course, the 89 class uh, that is seated on the balcony because they have the bigger overview. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great program for this uh, afternoon, and I uh, would like to start the program with the, the uh, address of the DS speech uh, at this very special occasion. And the title, ladies and gentlemen, of this DS speech is Are We Relevant? And it is an open question. An open question I would like to put to our academic community here at Tilburg University. It is by no means intended as a provocative or presumptuous statement. It is an honest question. It addresses both our present and our future, and the answer to it should determine the purpose of our university, and it should be in line with our values. The question as such is a meaningful one at three levels, and I would like to discuss the level, are we relevant as mankind, are we relevant as a university, and are we relevant as individuals? And I will elaborate on each of these in more detail. 
The reason for raising the question derives from the insights we obtain from the current developments taking place at the universal level. To illustrate this, I would like to refer to the work of the Italian professor of philosophy and ethics of information by the name of Luciano Floridi. He recently published a landmark book entitled The Fourth Revolution, How the Infosphere is Reshaping Human Reality. In this seminal work, Floridi argues that we are currently witnessing and experiencing a fourth revolution in the existing of mankind, a revolution that will substantially change the self-understanding of mankind. As was the case with the preceding three revolutions, the fourth revolution likewise is the result of a radical scientific transformation. And let me illustrate what the four revolutions are. The first one came about at the end of the Middle Ages and was the result of the work of Nicolaus Copernicus, who provided convincing evidence that displaced Earth from the center of the universe, and therefore mankind was no longer at the center of that universe. And that was a disillusion to mankind that drastically changed its self-understandings for the years thereafter. The second revolution, ladies and gentlemen, was caused by the evidence put forward by Charles Darwin in the 19th century about the evolution of mankind. Evidently, man was the result of an evolutionary process originating from common ancestors through natural selection, as it was called. And as it turned out, the race of mankind was not uniquely positioned at the center of the biological kingdom, which again was a major disillusion, once again drastically changing the self-understanding of mankind. The third revolution was brought about by Sigmund Freud in the early 20th century, who provided convincing evidence that, you, that the human brain contained the part that was independent in terms of self-determination, which implied that mankind was not fully in control of its own mind and therefore never able to achieve full individual self-consciousness. And this displaced mankind once again and this time from the center of pure and transparent consciousness. And finally, at present, we are entering the age, ladies and gentlemen, where developments in science and technology have made it possible to build artifacts that are smarter than we are, displacing us once again and now as the smartest objects on Earth. This last development is generally referred to as the digital revolution. As an example of the staggering process, progress that is made in this respect, I would like to mention IBM's natural language-based questioning and answering computer system called Watson, after the name, giving, name giver of IBM, which already, back in 2011, competed in the popular US quiz called Jeopardy and convincingly defeated two former winners, thus presenting proof of the assumption that mankind can be outperformed by a computer at cognitive level. In 2005, the computer scientist and futurologist Raymond Kurzweil elaborated on something that was called the technological singularity, a hypothesis put forward in 1993 by the science fiction author Werner Vinge, predicting that digital developments at some point in time will abruptly trigger a growth in artificial intelligence qualitatively surpassing human intelligence. Kurzweil expects this singularity to occur somewhere between 2030 and 2045. Obviously, we are entering this digital era with increased speed and the singularity 
may soon be upon us. And that brings me to the first point I would like to make in relation to the question, are we relevant? As designers and programmers of these disruptive systems at the singularity, we should be aware of the fact that we are still in a position to control them and to a large extent determine their functionality. We should take the responsibility to discuss the limits and boundaries of the behavior of these systems in their interaction with human beings, while computer systems as such so far have never been empathic and moral. But they should better be in the future. And if they are indeed going to be smarter than we are, they better also be more empathic and more moral than we are. One of the drivers of the singularity, ladies and gentlemen, is the data explosion that is currently going on worldwide. The figures that go with this development, often referred to as big data in general, provide convincing evidence that this unprecedented development is indeed taking place. Gartner reports that we currently have more than one billion websites. People are generating more than a half a billion tweets every day, followed by more than three billion likes every day. Every day, we upload some 300 million pictures, and every day, Google Voice processes more than 10 years of spoken text. Facebook has more than 8 billion users. Medical data is doubling every five years, and it is expected to grow to one zeta byte every day in 2020. A zeta byte, ladies and gentlemen, is a number consisting of a one followed by 21 zeros. We will be soon living in an always-on society surrounded by billions of devices that generate data in abundance. And the question is, how can we effectively process such vast amounts of data into meaningful information? What are the professional skills needed to perform this task? And who is capable of performing it? The fourth or digital revolution poses major challenges, and to stay relevant as mankind, we must assume the responsibility and face the challenge to avail ourselves of the opportunity offered by the singularity to eventually design intelligent systems that will contribute to the well-being and welfare of mankind, and therefore to all of us. The developments, ladies and gentlemen, driving the fourth revolution have given rise to a new type of professional, which we call a data scientist, and who is capable of turning massive amount of complex, hybrid, and seemingly unrelated information items into stories, stories that can be used by non-experts to make conscious decisions. Data science combines and integrates methods and techniques from various disciplines, such as statistics, process modeling, and analytics, machine learning, online algorithms, visualization, human-computer interaction, and security. In addition to these so-called hard disciplines, data science also requires the inclusion of deep insights into management and social and behavioral sciences, such as new business models, new economic and financial models, insights in behavior, legislation, and ethics. And these, ladies and gentlemen, are precisely the scientific domains that Tilburg University excels in. The fourth revolution thus provides us, as a university, with the unique opportunity to sustain and increase the relevance of our university. Data science will become the profession of the future. It was again Gartner that stated already back in 2012 that by 2015, that's a year ago, there would be a need worldwide 
of over 4 million data scientists. And that only a quarter of this number would be available by then. And this indeed turns to be true. Data scientists are the information and computer scientists, database and software programmers, disciplinary experts, curators and expert annotators, librarians, archivists, and all others who are crucial in the successful management of digital data collections. They will become the drivers of the digital age. And we refer to them as T-shaped people. I now come to the second point that I would like to discuss in relation to the notion of relevance of our university. Tilburg University already identified this major data science trend a few years ago and has developed and implemented a strategy to act on this opportunity. Together with the Technical University in Eindhoven, we have combined the full breadth of our available data science competences, ranging, as we call it, from ethics to mathematics in what we call the grand design on data science. We have designed a broad offering of educational programs in data science ranging from engineering to business and governance. And in addition to the activities taking place at the two university campuses in Eindhoven and Tilburg, a new campus is currently being developed. On December the 1st, ladies and gentlemen, in two weeks from now, we are proud to present the official opening of the Geronimus Academy of Data Science in Den Bosch as a joint effort of our two universities in North Brabant, together with the municipality Den Bosch and the province of North Brabant, focusing on data science and entrepreneurship. And this activity completes the grand design, which will then consist of one broad bachelor program, four master programs, one PDN program, one PhD program, and one executive education program, completed with three data science research centers. And in the end, some 2,000 students will eventually enroll in these programs, and the center will cover seven major research lines. With the grand design on data science, we will build in the Brainport region one of the strongest hubs on data science in Europe, driving disruptive innovation in this domain, attracting top talented researchers, teachers, entrepreneurs, and students. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a golden opportunity, and we will combine the necessary forces in the region to turn it into a world-class activity, and we will make it grow and blossom until it reaches its full potential. And the role of Tilburg University and its schools is paramount in turning this ambitious objective into a reality. And in this way, we can contribute significantly to the development of the fourth revolution and demonstrate the relevance of our university. And as you can see from this slide, it is already recognized by one of our main partners. Vision and leadership, ladies and gentlemen, go hand in hand. The first mover advantage that we have obtained so far, together with the Technical University in Eindhoven, and the other partners will soon expire if we are not able to deliver on our promise. Only by giving substance to the proposition, we will be able to make it work and achieve the ultimate success that we are striving for. And this calls upon us, who all participate in shaping the digital society, to make it a relevant contribution at our individual levels. We have many of such contributions, ladies and gentlemen. And let me give you a few examples just from within our own university, and let's have a look at the following video. Please go ahead.
I really want to make a difference when it comes to the quality of life of cancer patients. We see that now the, the cancer population is growing. More and more patients survive cancer and thereby they are not so much patients anymore as they are survivors or really impacting the quality of life of cancer survivors. Today, over 20,000 cancer patients have completed questionnaires and profiles. I have undersook nu five keer ingevuld. In the profile study, we do research about psychosocial effects of cancer and the treatment. Vlak nadat ik dat ziekteproces heb doorgemaakt, vond ik het wel ook fijn. Die manier wordt je wel gevraagd om even in de spiegel te kijken en even na te gaan van ja, hoe sta ik er nou eigenlijk voor? An important result is that some cancer therapies have changed because of the findings in the profiles registry. It would be very hard to do the same if there was no big data. By sharing your data with the scientific community, you can get the most out of your data. And I think that is important for patients as well as for researchers. But since we're investigating information from over 20,000 patients, we can really investigate the impact of certain therapies on patient outcomes. It's very useful to not only talk about an individual, but also answer questions about populations. Some patients would really call us and say, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. Ben ik nou uitzonderlijk of zit ik gewoon in het gemiddelde verwachtingspatroon wat je ziet bij ex-patiënten? Some of them now have fewer symptoms after cancer or have received better information or better supportive care. So I think with the findings of our studies we have really made a difference for some patients. Yeah. In the private label domain we basically find that the national brands are losing share. In the longer run uh, questions emerge on will this restrict the choice opportunities of the consumers. They have done so over the past two decades. Uh, as a result of very good quality private label and the close collaboration of retailers on the one hand and private label manufacturers on the other hand have resulted in very good quality products. So basically what you see is that private labels start to cover the entire spectrum of the offering while in the past they were more focused on the price sensitive consumers. It will eventually cause a reduction in the number of products that consumers can choose from consumers start to become more empowered because they can just open uh, the website of any retailer and start comparing because they have a way of communicating very quickly with one another if there is a certain problem with the product if the price is too high with one retailer versus another retailer so without visiting physically all those stores they can do this from their desk the economic world may not always have uh, easy access to uh, the practical side of the world, notably in private label. I basically work a lot with a number of data providers to develop uh, insights that are generalizable across a wide variety of settings. If the academic world comes together with ours, there may be a very successful and fruitful uh, uh, cross-fertilization between our two worlds. We as academics have basically the opportunity and the luxury to study those things and basically try to come up with some answers that help better decision making and in the end therefore helps uh, the consumer. The research that I'm doing at the moment looks at online platforms that create a new economy through digital media. Their importance is that they provide access to products and services uh, which we all need in life. Well, digital platforms are able to grow really fast because as soon as they start taking off, they become like, like magnets, simply because they become these hotspots of supply and demand. An important question is whether innovation through platforms should be regulated. The platforms are growing faster than uh, regulation uh, can keep up with. What you see is that these online platforms, that they become more and more powerful. Well, there are of course not only opportunities but also challenges between what, what, what's actually possible technically and what we would want as a society. And as lawyers we don't quite know how to answer all the problems that arise in this new economy. For example, if you have Uber, and something goes wrong, the consumer has an accident while driving in the taxi, can the consumer hold Uber liable? I can make a claim 
but my chances of being successful are much smaller than in case I'm uh, dealing with a business. Consumers may think that they are dealing with Uber, but Uber says we're not a party to the contract, which is in itself very problematic, because if we don't know who's responsible, then usually the weaker party, the consumer, has to carry their own damages. And if we monitor that and learn from that, then everybody will grow and benefit from it. My personal drive to do this kind of research is that I believe that law has a very important function to help change our relationships or structure them in a way that makes this world a better place for everyone. The scientist featuring in the video, ladies and gentlemen, all serve society with their knowledge in a professional way. They are keen to transfer their knowledge to others through well-coordinated actions, and in general terms, such approaches can be characterized by the following three principles. First, involve society in the programming of the programs. Measure scientific results by their societal impact and broaden the scientific basis in the academic education. At Tilburg University, we will be focusing our knowledge utilization activities in the years to come on the following three strategic social innovation teams. Generating value from data, personalized health and well-being, and the third one is toward a resilient society. Each of these teams is headed by an eminent scientist who will assume the role of figurehead and program manager. For generating value from data, this is Professor Dick Den Hertog. For personalized health and well-being, this is Professor Johan de Lunet. And for towards a resilient society, this role is taken up by Professor Tom Bildaren. Obviously, the collective and collaborative efforts are nice starting points on paper, but rather hard to achieve in practice of a modern science because of the intrinsic autonomy of science and the current system of scientific evaluation, ladies and gentlemen, in which the number of publications and personal prizes are seen as a supreme good. We need to open up to new ways of working, where teams and their effort are considered equally important as the effort of the individuals. This may even increase our relevance as individuals, because contributing to a team can be very stimulating and rewarding. In the spirit of Kobbenagen, the knowledge and expertise at our university become meaningful only if they are ultimately part of a practical wisdom that accepts the future by anticipating and shaping it. Society is currently subject to fast changes, and it is very complex and intends to become complex even more in the future. Therefore, the link between understanding society and advancing society is becoming more apparent. We will soon all have the opportunity to engage in the process of designing a new strategic plan for the year 2000. 18, 2021. The current strategic plan has served a great purpose in taking Tilburg University to the position where we stand now. In the new strategic plan, we should move Tilburg University into the digital age. Major questions to be addressed are, how can we further improve and expand our educational programs to increase the number of students studying here in Tilburg? How can we both strengthen and broaden our profile? How can we nourish and stimulate the growth of the teams we want to focus our utilization efforts on? Should we continue to seek and develop more off-campus activities? And do we need new ways of working to cope with all these fast changes in the future? The dawn of the digital age calls for a new plan and we should build that plan around the question, why and for what purpose are we running this university? 
in order to find the, question, the answer to this question, we will put the academics in the lead. And through a number of concerted actions, we will ask a broad section of the professionals working at Tilburg University for their opportunities and their opinions uh, for the future. Central to this process is what we called Speech 2025, an event where we can put anyone on stage that really has a message for this university. The plan that we will develop in this way will be presented to you as a community at the occasion of the opening of the academic year in 2017. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, we can say that Tilburg University is in good shape. It carries the potential of becoming an even stronger university by focusing on the role that we will play in society based on our scientific competences and on our profile. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the end of my speech. I would like to conclude with a short poem. A poem by a philosopher Wislawa Zimborska, who died a couple of years ago and who is very close to my heart. In 1997, she received the Nobel Prize for Literature and the jury called her the Mozart of Poetry. And they called her a woman who, with her words, sets out the lightness and transience of our existence. Thank you for your attention. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we now give the floor to one of our esteemed guests. It is a great pleasure for me to announce Professor Sally Wyatt. Sally is a professor of digital cultures in development at Maastricht University. She is a program leader of the e-humanities group of the uh, Netherlands Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a director of the WTMC, which uh, stands for Wetenschap, Technology and Modern Culture, the center at the university in Maastricht. She has a great reputation on e-humanities. She served at the British Econom Economic and Social Research Council and at the European Association for the Study of Science and Technology. Let's welcome Sally Wyatt. Well, thank you very much, uh, Meneer Director, and uh, Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon um, on this wonderful occasion of the birthday of the university. Um, just making sure I can put my papers and things here and get myself settled. Right. As you've already heard, I've been thinking about digital technologies for a very long time, from a time when we called them other things. Um, information and communication technologies, information technologies, all sorts of different kinds of words. Um, and I'm going to reflect a little bit on some of my past experiences thinking about these things. But they continue to play an important role in our kind of present and our future. This is not quite a random collection from uh, the world's press over the last week or two, but almost. And you can see, you know, um, and this, I mean, I think I did this last week, but there's been even more in the press in the last few days about, you know, what was the role of uh, Facebook in the election uh, in the United States last week? Is the internet, uh, is Facebook simply a platform or is it a news organization which would have consequences for how it was regulated, as we've also just heard? Um, also just heard a little bit about Uber and uh, who's really responsible and all these kind of um, sharing uh, platforms that are emerging. I also met a robot this morning. I, I came a bit earlier and met uh, a very nice um, robot, smaller robot than the one that uh, meets uh, Angela Merkel there, but a robot who is being trained to teach children a second language. 
Other examples here, um, I like this one, the, the perils of sharenting. It didn't make it as the new word for 2016. That was post-truth. Um, but sharenting is another interesting, actually rather old phenomenon of you know, those parents who feel moved to share every single moment of their child's lives. Um, and uh, questions are now emerging. Or how are the children going to feel about this um, as time goes on? We've seen also already an example of a computer um, doing very well in playing a game that we think is extremely complicated. And what I'd also, I'm going to talk first of all a little bit about kind of more general issues around what digital technologies are doing for our world. And then I want to spend some time on what they mean for the ways in which we do research and scholarship and science. Now, one of the interesting things about digital technologies, um, well, first of all, to make my point about, there are lots of different words around. Um, you can play this at home. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. But you can put more or less any of the words um, on the far side in front of any of the kind of ones in the red box. Um, and uh, this list isn't exhaustive. Um, and the descriptors are, are varied. They change over time. Um, some are very descriptive. Some carry normative connotations. Virtual can simply mean digitally mediated, or it can suggest almost, not quite real. Or back in the kind of 90s, sometimes when we talked about virtual communities, we sometimes kind of were trying to suggest they weren't quite as good as real communities. I think that kind of connotation has changed now. But the point is that um, you can choose different sorts of words. Um, this varies by, over time, it varies by language, and it varies by discipline. I was saying, one of the interesting things about um, digital technologies is the way in which they provoke all sorts of hopes and fears about society today and in the future. They're often quite extreme. They're also kind of repetitive when you get to be really old like I am. So we hear that they liberate people from the constraints imposed by their bodies and by geography, that they will be used to improve democracy and social justice, Whereas others kind of point to the dangers of greater social inequality, greater social control through surveillance um, via kind of not only cameras, but increasingly via data. Now, the nice thing about these kinds of claims um, is that they do at least emphasize the choice and the agency of individuals, groups, companies, and nation states. But sometimes the ambivalence gives a kind of illusion, I think, of neutrality. So we often talk about ambivalence in terms of the same technology having different effects, depending upon the context in which it's used and taken up. But I thought for a change um, to make the ambivalence point by showing how the same claims can apply to different technologies. Now, you've been looking at this for a while now. Um, I'm not going to read it out. You can all read, um, I'm assuming. Um, but. Um, uh, we're not going to play the game interactively, that would take too long, um, but I, and I have a few of these. But this, you can see it has many of the same kinds of claims we get about the internet, um, but this was actually written about the telegraph. Um, the next one, this is uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, great hopes, um, this terribly disappointed community that with the help of a wonderful new communication medium, um, you know, started embracing democracy and community. This was about television in the 1950s. Now, for anyone who's watched television in the United States recently, you, this, you know, seems like an unlikely claim. It didn't quite turn out that way. This next one, um, again, uh, a technology that's going to be, you know, subversive to the established order of things. Um, this is one that probably not many of you have much experience of. This was written about community video in Canada, which is uh, the country I originally come from. Um, community video was very important in the 1970s because television didn't work so well because of um, the geography of Canada. Community video was seen as a kind of great hope for mobilizing communities. Don't worry, I'm going to stop. This doesn't go on forever. Um, this, um, again, uh, written a bit later, you can probably um, guess this goes back much further um, to the printing press. 
And this one, I like this one, um, again, a medium that's going to bring peace and light and good things to the world, and actually one of my still very favorite mediums, the radio. Um, and then much more recently, I'm not going to make you guess this one, um, Twitter, exactly the same kinds of claims about the ways in which a new kind of medium of communication and information will um, bring democracy to a part of the world that um, has less kind of <coughs> tradition of it. And then finally, um, you do have to guess, this kind of brings them all together. Um, it's going to have consequences for how we live and work, our health care, our industry. Um, and this appeared just a few months ago in the new document from the VSNU, the uh, kind of Dutch University Association, which is wanting to promote, again, a kind of research agenda around the digital society. Now, of course, um, the world has changed um, since the printing press, since television, since radio, um, and we need to continue to pay attention to these sorts of things. Um, and we've also, but we've also learned things, and I think it's important not always to kind of look to the future, but sometimes to maybe think a little bit about, well, have we learned anything from what happened with the radio, printing press, and um, other kinds of technologies. So I want to say a little bit about um, what we've learned, well, not only from social science, but also from the humanities and other disciplines about social transformations, and also what we've learned already from these successive generations of digital technologies. So, I think we've learned a lot, actually, about social transformations. Um, <coughs> clearly, both uh, Marx and Weber, um, who were both, well, slightly different times in the 19th century, um, had a lot to say about industrialization and bureaucracy and how technologies were being used to transform work. Uh, Schumpeter and Keynes are two economists um, from kind of earlier in the 20th century, when there were a time of great kind of financial and economic crisis and unemployment, and introduced already ideas about technological unemployment, crises of kind of innovation. Schumpeter had a lot to say about innovation and how we should be kind of managing it. Um, and the Frankfurt School from the kind of middle of the 20th century who, who had a lot to say about how we should be understanding uh, the kind of superstructure in, economy, in our societies, particularly the kind of press and things like that. Now, the two pictures that are on that slide um, are, um, and we saw a kind of version of it um, in the rector's speech as well, um, connections are not evenly distributed in the world. This is a kind of map that's adjusted to kind of you know, uh, illustrate um, the density of internet connection. Um, the 44 number that's there is the percentage of the world's population that has access to the internet. Um, of course, in a country like the Netherlands, it's something like 93%, um, I believe. Um, yes, 93%, higher already than the European Union average, which is at 80%. Um, but the least developed countries in the world, according to the UN, it's only 12%, and in some of those it's even less. So the benefits that are clearly kind of promised and many of us are already enjoying as a result of the diffusion and take up of digital technologies aren't actually evenly distributed throughout the world. Um, and I think this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who knows a bit of history or knows a bit of history about technology, industrialization, and and other things. But what have we learned about um, technologies, digital or otherwise? Um, so uh, when the rector introduced me, he said, I am also the director of VTM Say, that's the Dutch Graduate Research School in Science, Technology, and Modern Culture. Um, and people there spend a lot of time thinking about technologies um, and what they kind of might mean. And one of the things that people kind of always say is, you know, we like to think technologies are kind of neutral, they're just kind of built in order, 
you know, they kind of meet the laws of physics and other sorts of things and economic efficiency. But there's been a lot of work of many different kinds of technologies to sort of kind of come to the conclusion, well, actually, technologies have politics. They have techno they're made by people, for people, for particular purposes, and sometimes ideas about a kind of how society should be kind of formed um, are kind of built in and have, can sometimes be very difficult to change them. But I think for us concerned with digital technologies, we need to ask ourselves questions like, you know, why is bandwidth important? Does it matter where servers are located? How do search engines actually work? Those are all extremely important kind of political kinds of questions. Another important issue that I think we've learned from histories of tech, history and philosophy of technology is that um, yeah, new technologies might come in, all kind of shiny and new and, and promising new things, but they're introduced into you know, the world that we've got. Um, and it takes, they kind of coexist for a while. And they, so one of the interesting things about digital media is that it hasn't kind of completely kind of wiped out newspapers, radio, and television, but that these things are kind of coexisting. They're also kind of coexisting and adapting to one another because of the, kind, the ways in which media are kind of regulated. Systems that were developed for kind of older media maybe or maybe not being terribly well adapted for new media. One of my favorites, and that's what the picture of the meerkat on a very old-fashioned bicycle kind of is a reference to for some of you might understand. Um, one of the kind of starting points in science and technology studies is that technologies could have been otherwise. All Dutch people could have been riding around on bicycles like this. Um, there are reasons why you are not. Um, and, but kind of realizing that technologies could have developed in different sorts of directions is also, I think, a reminder that they can be developed differently in the future. We don't have to just kind of accept what we've got. We can work hard, many of you in this room are doing that, to kind of develop new technologies to fulfill and meet different kinds of needs. And then finally, I think something um, a lot of us have learned is, uh, this is certainly not new, that knowledge is power. But I think particularly what's relevant for digital technologies is understanding that the kinds of classification systems that are really kind of central to the smooth operation of many digital technologies, that those classifications, um, again, are not necessarily neutral, that they might have politics, and they certainly have consequences. So I think we've got a lot that we can kind of build on as we kind of go forward to think about digital technologies, how we can understand them, how we can take best advantage of them. So now I'd like to talk a bit more about what this means for us in universities, in Tilburg and elsewhere. And again, first of all, I think it's important to understand a bit of the changing context of universities and the world that we live in. So certainly since the end of the Second World War and the second half of the 20th century, in a country like the Netherlands and in most uh, Western countries, the, kind of, the world has changed a bit. One important development has been you know, a huge growth um, in the number of universities, um, the numbers of staff members, the numbers of students, and also associated with that, at least partly, I think, is the emergence of many new interdisciplines, whether that's kind of women's studies or uh, bioinformatics. All sorts of new kinds of fields are, have emerged over the last 40 or 50 years. Another thing I'm sure many of us um, in these first five or six rows are familiar with is the increased accountability that we have for our work and what we do. Um, the quantity and the quality of our output, which we're constantly held to account for, which is fine, it's public money, we should be held accountable. Um, the way we do it, we might want to think a bit harder about, but that would be a different story. Um, but I think another thing that we've seen a lot over the last 30 or 40 years is different kinds of actors coming into the university, that we are no longer, if we ever were, a kind of remote ivory tower, but more and more um, groups are kind of wanting to work together with the universities. A third um, important development is the success of big science, huge kind of collaborations, um, both interdisciplinary and across countries. 
Um, and there are some policy makers who think, well, if big science worked for physics, it should work for philosophy, and we'll see how that works out. Um, but it becomes a kind of normative ideal. And the, I think the important point and what's most relevant for us here today is that digital technologies are really quite kind of important in all of these kinds of developments. Certainly in big science, without the, I mean, we had big science before we had computers, but it took a lot longer to communicate with one another. Um, and that's what I kind of want to talk about now. Some of you will recognize this as a kind of, you know, very quick and dirty summary of very complex literature around mode two and the triple helix and, and things like that, and my apologies for doing it so quickly. Um, but I'd also just like to draw your attention to this, I think, rather wonderful picture um, that illustrated Vannevar Bush's um, original article, As We May Think, in which he reflected a lot um, about what those early computers um, that were developed during the war were going to mean for um, life. Um, Anyway, what I like about this picture is two things. One, he seemed to have imagined, or the illustrator of the article, um, seems to have imagined tablet computers um, quite accurately. Um, but what I like about the picture, because I'm interested in technology, is that kind of under the desk, you see all the kind of, you know, pulleys and whistles and wires that actually kind of make the things work. Because I think sometimes we have a tendency to think, God, this stuff is amazing, sort of magic boxes, but actually digital technologies are extremely complex material phenomena full of cables and satellites and servers and wires, and it's good to kind of be reminded of that. So we can play the same game again. Um, I won't spend very long on this, where you can, again, take all of those prefixes about digital and cyber and E and online and distance and tele and computational and put them next to words um, associated with the production of knowledge. And again, these kind of go through fashions. Some of them are more kind of popular in some countries than in others. They're popular with particular kind of policy makers at particular times. And it's always good to kind of ask yourself, why have they picked that particular combination kind of now? Um, Americans talk a lot about cyber infrastructures. We don't do that so much in Europe. Um, and, uh, okay. But again, thing, we know things already about how technologies affect the production of knowledge. And again, the rector already alluded to some of these sorts of things. And one of the things we know, and Galileo found this out uh, as well, that knowledge is always inscribed in and by instruments. Um, what we can see at what kind of scale um, is very much kind of dependent on the kind of research tools, the research infrastructures that are available to us. Another thing we know, well, I think we know, um, is that the production of knowledge is deeply social. Um, some of us might like to think and some of us really quite like sitting by ourselves in our offices, um, reading and thinking and, and writing, but Pretty much, you know, we get time to do that, but knowledge production is a very, very social activity. In some disciplines, that's kind of completely kind of taken for granted and self-evident, and I think in the humanities and the social sciences, sometimes we could learn more from our colleagues in the natural sciences and in the engineering who tend to work together kind of more often and more easily. Um, so in those kinds of fields, knowledge is very, kind of socially produced, people together in a lab, working together, some people doing one thing, other people doing another thing, and together they kind of come up with new knowledge. Um, that's what I mean by the context of discovery, but also in the context, and I think particularly in the context of justification and use. The way that kind of, that academic publishing works, the ways in which citation works, the ways in which knowledge gets taken up in teaching, in policy, is a very, very kind of social process. So one of the questions um, I think we need to ask ourselves with the increasing take up and use of um, sort of big data, data science, computational kind of techniques in and across all sorts of disciplines is what is it going to mean for how do we do science? And this, I'm be glad to know I'm not going to go through this, this would take me kind of, you know, three months to go through this slide, um, about the history of kind of scientific reasoning and different kinds of styles of reasoning. Um, and kind of what's listed there are, you know, what 
kind of his historians and philosophers of science have identified as you know important styles of um, of reasoning. And the important kind of point um, I want to make here is that you know it's not that one displaces the other. Um, these can coexist. Um, and I think one of the interesting questions for us now is are we seeing the emergence of a computational style in across the kind of uh, university? Um, and what would that actually mean? And I think it raises some quite profound epistemological questions about, you know, if we're saying that in order to do research nowadays, it has to use computers, what does that mean for the relationship between the digital and the physical worlds? Are we going to be missing things? Are we going to be capturing everything we want to capture? So I want to end with a kind of a couple of examples about um, involving new groups in the production of knowledge. Um, this is a kind of screenshot from Zooniverse. Some of you might be familiar with Galaxy Zoo that started a few years ago where a bunch of astronomers got together and thought we need to identify galaxies. Computers are still not terribly good at identifying patterns. Let's ask the people. And the people came and identified patterns and it was very successful. Um, one of the most successful models of citizen science or participatory science. And they've now kind of expanded this um, and do all sorts of things from, you know, looking at uh, emigration and what it means for cities and uh, Shakespeare and, you know, not just galaxies and uh, supernovas. Um, there was a more recent example, um, many of you might have uh, captured about a year ago, um, when the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, working together with uh, Naturalis, a biodiversity center, and Comet, a big kind of consortium around uh, the IT industry, kind of opened up um, the Rijksmuseum on the 4th of October, World Animal Day, for people to come in and identify all the birds, um, which was an interesting project, not only for art historians, but also for people interested in the history of birds. I can see with this rather alarming red light over there um, that I've run out of time, so I'm not going to be able to tell you about a wonderful example about um, uh, from I kind of wanted to make the point that participatory knowledge production, knowledge has always been kind of socially produced, even in monasteries. Um, who got to do it might have changed, but that's there. Um, and this wonderful example about the Devonshire manuscript, which is kind of an early kind of 16th century example of fan fiction, basically. Um, the court of Anne Boleyn, one of the unfortunate wives of Henry VIII, had this kind of book that got passed around, and people would write poetry in it, and they'd annotate it. Um, and kind of literary historians are now kind of working on that, um, both uh, in a kind of crowdsourced way um, to kind of un try and understand who were all the different contributors, what does that tell us about the kind of court of Anne Boleyn, because um, it was also an interesting example at that time of men and women kind of working together. Um, but they've also tried to kind of make a social electronic edition of this, which is extremely interesting. If you want to know more, contact me and I can put you in touch with the group of people who are doing that, where they're making this social edition of the Devonshire manuscript. So, I would like to end by kind of asking all of us who are the kind of present and the future of um, knowledge production, what kind of knowledge do we want to produce? How, what kinds of technologies do we want to help us produce that? Um, and I think a university like Tilburg is extremely well placed to do that. Um, my apologies for all of the undoubtedly interesting and important work going on in Tilburg that I didn't put on this screen. Um, but um, looking around, you know, your website, um, I could see that, you know, Tilburg is indeed very well placed to meet the challenges of the kind of latest generation of digital technologies. And as a final remark, I mean, I, I like your slogan, understanding society, I can kind of live with that. Um, my only kind of reminder is to understand society, you also have to understand technology. Technology is itself a kind of social achievement and the ways in which our societies are constituted, the ways in which they work is very much kind of conditioned and structured and molded and shaped by the technologies that we have. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sally, for your great contribution to our dig digital thinking. Um, as a small token of appreciation, these uh, two presents for you, Thank you very from much. Tilburg University. This feels and like a very old medium. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy it. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us uh, uh, to the point in time where a small interlude uh, seems uh, desirable. It is uh, a pleasure for me to introduce to you five ladies. They have bewitching voices. I heard them at the Eindhoven University of Technology just a year ago, and I thought we should bring this to Tilburg as well. And we uh, will do that today. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lea, Pitu, Ingrid, Saskia, and Lonneke are going to sing for us some four songs, and I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you very much, Cobra Ensemble. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are now building up tension in the hall. At least that's what I hope. We now will uh, get to the point where we uh, will celebrate the successes of a number of people. It gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to make the following special announcement. As of December 1st this year, Professor Dr. Ernst Hirsbalin will be appointed Distinguished University Professor of this university. <applause> professor Hirs Balin, who is Professor of Dutch and European Constitutional Law at Tilburg University, has been appointed because of his outstanding achievements in his academic work, as well as for his social commitment to human dignity, social justice, and the rule of law, which enables us as human persons to live together in peace and liberty. Ernst Hirs Balin is the first professor, to the best of my recollection, of this university to be awarded this special title. I hope, yes, great. <sighs> Ever since 1981, when he became a professor of constitutional uh, and, and administrative law at University of Tilburg, um, and this is his home ground. He combined his professorship with his work in both judicial and public office, which included his two terms as a minister of justice and as a Minister of Interior and Kingdom Relations. He continues to be involved in the practice of development of law as a member of counseling bodies like the Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy and the Advisory Council on International Affairs. Ernst, we are so grateful that you are at our university and that you have accepted this title. So may I please invite you to come up the corona so that uh, we can shake hands once more, ladies and gentlemen. We have a great man. Thank you very much, Director Magnificus, and uh, thank you. Um, uh, the deans of the faculties, especially the, uh, the dean of Tilburg Law School for uh, bestowing this honor on me. Um, I'm grateful to uh, be appointed as the first university professor of our university. And I accept humbly this honor and privilege um, also as a duty, as a, a duty indeed to continue to contribute to the research and teaching of public law, constitutional law, especially um, at our university. Indeed, it was um, in 1981 when I was <coughs> appointed for the first time um, to the chair for constitutional and administrative law, and since then, uh, Tilburg University has really become my academic home. It was not my first encounter with Tilburg University. That was in 1972. I was a student at the University of Amsterdam, my alma mater, um, and um, I was fascinated by uh, what I heard at the 45th anniversary of this university. Um, I was also fascinated by one of uh, the students of the university, Pauline, um, who is also here, um, uh, soon thereafter, my girlfriend and fiancé and wife. Um, and uh, when I uh, continued on the path of dealing with questions of public law, of constitutional law especially, um, I uh, discovered how important and how inspiring it was to reach out to other fields of research and legal development, including the judiciary and, um, and politics. Uh, but it has become since then uh, the subject of my inaugural address in 1981 was um, trust in the rule of law. 
um, that trust in the rule of law depends not only on the quality of our rules and institutions, but also in the spirit with which these rules are applied and further developed. And for that reason, it was really important for me, and I hope also for my work, to uh, be involved in uh, other responsibilities than merely the academic uh, responsibilities. I hope to continue on that path and to reach out as your university professor to um, not only to academic audiences, but also to uh, other audiences, maybe also with different approaches in communication about that, but without compromising the level of the way in which we deal with these questions. Uh, constitutional law is not merely about institutions and processes. It is about human dignity, about the gradual realization of human rights, of the um, recognition of human dignity and equality. And we must be aware how vulnerable these uh, complexities of the uh, constitutional systems are, how um, they are connected, interconnected across our borders um, worldwide, in Europe, world, but also worldwide. And I'm grateful for the inspiration that I continue to receive from my colleagues at this university and also at other, place, other places, including the Inter-University Assel Institute for European and International Law, and in, uh, well, in society in general. So thank you very much for bestowing this honor on me, and I, um, uh, um, I will do my utmost to meet your expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Real time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we now, ladies and gentlemen, continue, and uh, we will honor two other very special persons. Um, we will award two doctorates honoris causa to two esteemed scholars from the United States of America. Let us now proceed with the official part of this ceremony. On the recommendation of the Dean of the Tilburg School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Doctorate Board of Tilburg University has decided in its meeting of May 10th to confer the degree of Dr. Honoris Causa on George Fraud. Lewenstein for his exceptional achievements in the social and behavioral sciences. I invite Professor Marcel Zeelenberg to make known the state on what grounds this decision has been based and I authorize him to invest George Freud Lewenstein with this dignity. Please step forward. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Dr. Lowenstein, dear George, um, you will be the, the, the 22nd doctorate I hand out, uh, but it will be a special one. Um, I mean, of course, all the doctors I hand out and will hand out are special ones. Um, don't worry. But you're extra special because you're the first one that's actually older than I am. So that is, that is already special. You're the first one that actually already is a doctor. So that's also uh, special. You're also the first one that did not have to cope with four years of supervision by me. So you might not only be special, but also be a lucky one. Um, but that is not to say that you did not deserve this doctorate. When, uh, quite opposite, when we, um, Ilya van Beest and I, were asked about a year ago as a representative of the Department of Social Psychology and the Tiber Institute to whether we would like to propose a candidate for this degree, we immediately thought of you, primarily because when we grow up, we want to be George Lowenstein. You know, it's quite something to be, uh, to, to be you. And that needs some, some explanation, I think, because Ilya and I are psychologists for the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and we propose an economist to receive our honorary degree. Why is that the case? Well, I think it is the case um, because you're not really a psych uh, an economist. You are an economist, but you're also sort of a psychologist. And the name of your chair, 
you are a, a un university professor at Carnegie Mellon, but you're also the Herbert Simon Professor of Economics and Psychology. We live in the Herbert Simon Building, the Tilburg School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and you share quite some uh, um, um, things with Herbert Simon, a scholar, a social and behavioral scientist um, that contribute to many different fields. You are intellectually very related to him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, George Lowenstein contributions to science are enormous, not only in the fields of economics and psychology, but also in uh, um, uh, the fields of health behaviors, policy making, conflicts of interest in auditors, um, privacy issues related to internet usage and big data. Uh, George published an influential paper on questionable research practices, um, and I think Foremost, he's known to be one of the founding fathers of both um, behavioral economics and neuroeconomics, a field that we in Tilburg like to refer to as economic psychology. Um, I think that together, you are clearly an honorable doctor for the whole school and not only for our department. If you read George's CV, which you can download from the internet, um, you can see that he clusters his publications topic-wise. It's not just a list of, of papers, but it's, it needs to be clustered topic-wise. And the topics are intertemporal choice, bargaining and social comparison, basic research on preferences, emotions and taste prediction, the psychology and economics of information, neuroeconomics, sympathy, generosity, and the uh, identifiable victim effect, sex and relationships, policy, conflicts of interest, privacy, health issues, diet and exercise, uh, smoking, obesity, philosophy, uh, history, and methods, and each of these topics comprises of dozens of papers. Um, so I invite you to go on the web and search out who he is if you don't already know it. His age index is 113, and there's like almost 70,000 citations to his work. And um, we've seen George over the last few days. I don't think there will be an end to it soon. Uh, I'm not going to review all of this work here now, but I want to single out a few of his uh, achievements, and primarily those that are not directly related to economics. I mean, it's a doctorate degree of the Tilburg School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, so there's three things I want to uh, single out. One is among his uh, most cited papers. The paper is called Out of Control, Visceral Influences on Behavior, and it's an article published in a special issue of Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, edited by our own Guidon Kieran, who's also here. So that's, that's really nice. And that is work in the tradition, I would say, of Adam Smith's uh, work on the theory of moral sentiments. It's about the role of emotions in behavior. And this paper, together with an article on risk and feelings published in Psychological Bulletin, and a paper on emotions in economic theory and economic behavior published in the American Economic Review, uh, forms a, a body of knowledge that has influenced uh, the thinking about the roles of emotions in behavior by many of us. So that is, uh, I think, a real achievement. There's another paper that I find exemplary of George's um, um, being, and that is The Psychology of Curiosity, published in Psychological Bulletin in 1994. And that paper um, introduces a new theory about curiosity. It's called Information Gap Theory. And it claims that we're most curious about the things we already know a lot about, but some of the things are lacking. There's a gap in our knowledge that's very motivated to close that gap. And the funny thing, one of the funny things about that paper is, I think, its history, how that paper came about. Before that paper, uh, George Lowenstein worked on an empirical project uh, that he wanted to publish about, um, uh, about curiosity and information gap theory. And um, reviewers apparently hated that article. He had a hard time getting that published. And one of the reviewers said, it's clear that you don't know anything about curiosity. And out of resentment, George said, I'm going to review all the literature that is out there and publish a top paper that actually summarizes all of it, and I'll show them that I know everything about uh, curiosity. Well, um, the resentment was satisfied. The paper was published in Psychological Bulletin, our top outlet uh, for that type of papers, and um, George never took the effort to publish the empirical work that started this. I think he was satisfied with, with that. And I think that shows how George's mind works and how his motivation works and how academic motivation sometimes works like motivation of real people. So that is, that, that is, I think, insightful. Finally, the last thing, 
a non-economic uh, topic that George has been active on um, that is, I find really interesting. Um, George published six papers on the psychology of sex. And sex, according to, to George, and I cannot uh, disagree with him, is one of the most important behaviors that we engage in. If we talk about whether we are relevant, I think um, sex is like really relevant because if there were no sex, we would not be here. You know, we, we, well, we would not exist. It's seriously understood, understood. There's hardly any research on sex. And George works very closely in the tradition of Jeremy Bentham, the famous British philosopher who introduced the concept of utility and um, um, believed that sex was one of the most important drivers of human happiness. And he um, also very much propagated free sex for everybody. Jeremy Bentham, that is. Um, George last year published a paper in which he investigated whether an increase in sexual frequency enhances people's happiness, according to his own theory. Uh, the paper found it did not. And uh, as a real academic uh, uh, does, um, he is not really satisfied yet. He, he believes his own data, but he, he does believe now that this study didn't really test the prediction he was putting forward. So I hope that there is much more research um, coming from that uh, uh, angle. Um, taken together, when thinking about who the Tilburg School of Social and Behavioral uh, Sciences could put forward as an honorable doctor in this year, we could not think of anybody else than George Lowenstein. Ladies and gentlemen. Apparently, I forgot the important formula I have to yes. speak out, but um, there are people that are better organized than I am. Apologies for that. There we go. I hope this gave you the time to get to the, the, the COPPA. By virtue of the authority granted to us by law and by the regulation of the university, in accordance with the decision by the doctorate board of Tilburg University, I hereby promote you, George Freud Lowenstein, to Dr. Honoris Causa and bestow upon you all the rights that by law or custom are or will be attached to the doctorate. In evidence, I clothe you with the Kappa of Tilburg University and hand out you the certificate signed by the Rector Magnificus and the Honorary Doctorate Supervisor reaffirmed by the seal of the university. told I um, get to keep this, I get to take it home, and I've been trying to think about where I can wear it. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think if, I, if I wear it around my um, department, I don't think my colleagues are, gonna, are going to be that happy with me. And I think my family is going to have pretty much the same reaction as my colleagues. But um, I, I, I'll find an I'll find occasion. Um, <laughs> It's, a, um, of course, a great honor and a pleasure to um, get this um, honorary degree from the um, university. Um, this is a whole lot um, easier than my um, first, um, than my first PhD, um, which is, which is um, great. Um, and I have a lot of, um, I'm really thrilled about um, getting this 
um, degree because I um, have a lot of connections to Tilburg um, and particularly to the to Tiber, the Tilburg Center for Behavioral Economics uh, Research. I was at a meeting of Tiber, I think about three years ago, and I heard um, one of the most interesting um, talks that I've um, maybe even heard in my life from um, one of your former students, Ellen Evers, who was um, writing a doing dissertation research under um, Marcel Zeilenberg's um, guidance. The, I found the research so um, interesting that I came up to her afterwards and talked to her and asked her if I could um, be part of the research, and so we've been um, collaborating since then. And actually, the um, research um, stimulated so much, it really changed my thinking about a lot of things. I ended up um, writing a paper um, titled um, The Drive for Sensemaking, arguing that um, sensemaking, like, like um, hunger and thirst, um, is, a, is a drive, very much like these other um, drives. And it was this, this paper that really stimulated that um, idea. Um, Tilburg's a world um, center of behavioral um, decision research, as well as behavioral economics, and that's appropriate because a lot of our research um, involves drawing numbers from urns and then having people gamble on numbers drawn from urns. And I've been told that urns have a special significance for the citizens of the city. Um, I, know, I don't think the, um, the activity that they're known for doing with the urns is not um, drawing numbers and gambling, but it's, some, it's something else, um, which I probably shouldn't um, mention. But. Um, um, coming from a, a university um, in which engineering and um, computer science are the kind of high status areas, that it, um, Carnegie Mellon was started out as um, Carnegie Institute of Technology. It's really great to be getting an honorary degree from a university um, with a focus on the social and behavioral sciences. Um, in the U.S., there's a big push um, towards getting students to take um, STEM fields, science, technology, um, engineering and math, and particularly to getting um, women into the STEM fields, and um, and starting with girls. I have a, da a uh, daughter who is applying for colleges, and you and I can see the effect of this push on her and her friends. They all want to go into STEM fields. Um, it's it's very successful. They're all applying into engineering programs and things like that, and. Um, I've been um, delicately raising the question with her of maybe, since everyone else is doing STEM now, maybe she should think about the um, social sciences. I do that very delicately because usually her response um, to me, uh, if I raise anything, is like, um, "Stop trying to um, like um, stop trying to influence me. Try, try, try don't try to live my life for me." Um, but um, maybe even though. She hasn't responded that positively. Maybe, maybe I've had some influence on her. And the reason I think that, um, the reason I'd be thrilled if she went into the social and behavioral sciences is partly because I think they're um, more interesting. Um, it's more interesting to study people than to study like particles and membranes. But also um, because arguably I think that so the social sciences, the social and the behavioral sciences are more important um, in this day and age than technology, which I, might sound paradoxical given um, how important technology is um, right now. I, um, I started out in a STEM field myself. I started out in computer science, and then I switched to economics, and when I got to graduate school, I started doing um, some psychology, and I'm very glad that I made that um, transition. Um, and so I think um, the social and the behavioral sciences are, as I said, are um, in some ways more interesting, and I think they're also um, more important. When I um, grew up, there was a, a, a big faith in the, in the power of um, science. Like, um, we had a drink called Tang. It was like an orange drink, and that was considered, and Tang, looking back on it, it was this horrible artificial powder, but that was like, considered like the modern drink. It was actually it was advertised as the drink of astronauts. I think they gave, they um, the astronauts drank it, and margarine was considered um, really wonderful new product. And I think 
to some degree, some kind of disillusionment um, has um, set in in terms of our perspective on um, science. The computers seem to um, be getting smarter and smarter. Um, but if anything, and um, this is a, a view that I've been holding even more strongly since last Tuesday, it seems like um, humans, if anything, seem to be getting less um, smart. Um, and um, if, if, you look at, if you look at some of the major problems um, in the world, um, I think three of the most important problems are climate change, um, changes in employment as a result of um, new technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, and finally income inequality. If you look at these different um, problems, it's true that um, science and technology um, play a role, but I think arguably so the social and decision sciences are even more important. Let's start with um, global warming. Um, it's tr in my view, our, our, at this point, our only hope is for developments in technology, develop, developments in electricity, tran um, generation, transmission, and storage. But I think that psychology and economics have even more important things to offer. The first thing that psychology and economics has to offer when it comes to glo um, global warming or climate change is an explanation for why it's such a difficult problem to solve. We have the concept of a free rider problem, the tragedy of the commons in psychology, or the concept of externalities, that um, each of us makes it, each of us, even each, any country, um, has an inappreciable, maybe our, my country, not quite, but has an inappreciable impact on the problem. And so cutting back on our carbon emission, emissions at an individual level um, has an imperceptible impact, but a very perceptible impact on our own well-being. Um, so that's a classic externality. I mean, economics also has the best remedy for climate change, and that is a carbon tax or cap and trade. Um, and this is a remedy that's exactly designed to get people to internalize the externality that they don't ordinarily, uh, that they don't ordinarily inter um, internalize the, the um, impact of their carbon emissions on, on the world, on current generations, future generations. Um, and if, if um, energy were priced um, correctly, not only would people use a lot less of it, but all sorts of alternative, all of these technologies would develop much faster. There'd be um, economic incentives for people to innovate and invest in these technologies. The, um, the third thing that I think that the social and behavioral sciences um, have to offer when it comes to climate change is um, clues about um, what might be the biggest riddle when it comes to climate change, and that is our failure to do anything about the problem, our collective failure. So in the United States, after 9-11, we basically um, turned our society upside down um, in, out of fear of terrorism. Terrorism has not killed a lot of people. Climate change is threatening the um, well-being and the very existence of future generations, even of the current generation, and we're collectively doing amazingly little to deal with the problem. And I think that um, psychology has some important insights about why that is. Um, I think it could be argued that our um, emotion system is really, really badly designed to um, deal with a problem like climate change. Our emotion system um, evolved in a time, at times when <clears throat> the biggest, um, a lot of our emotion system actually evolved before we were even human but it evolved at a time when the biggest threats facing us were immediate and obvious, like um, a predator bearing down, you know, threatening us or something like that. Um, our emotion systems are not very good at dealing with problems that are uncertain, that are remote. We're not, um, we're not very sympathetic. Um, our emotion systems evolved for us to be sympathetic to people who are in our clan, who are in our immediate environment. Um, not to be very sympathetic to people who are in other countries and so on. And so I think we're almost uniquely badly suited when it comes to um, um, emotions, and psychology really provides insights into this, into dealing with this, um, one of the most important problems. 
Um, as I said, climate change is one of the three problems I'd rank highest in priority. I would say that the, the effects of automation, artificial intelligence, and robots on employment is the second. Like climate change, we're probably already seeing the advanced effects of these developments on our society, but we don't even know it. In some ways, I think the recent election in the United States um, is a manifestation of these changes, the changes in technology and a big fraction of the population um, becoming, in effect, obsolete. Um, the biggest, the biggest um, area, the, the biggest employer in the United States right now is truck driving. And Uber and other companies are developing technologies which in the next few, even the next few years, may um, decimate the need for truck driving. And so society is going to, our, our society is going to change dramatically. There's going to be a need for different types of employment. There may be a need for less employment overall. And how we deal with these um, types of, th these, are pro these are problems that are caused by technology, but whether we deal with them successfully and how we deal with them um, are largely an issue of the social and behavioral sciences. We need to rethink work. We need to rethink um, how people derive meaning in our society. Um, there's some very, very difficult problems. Fin let me turn finally to um, income inequality. Income inequality is arguably at the root of a whole lot of problems in the world and certainly in the United States, including our obesity epidemic, our low savings, mass incarceration. I think it's, um, there's been an unprecedented decline in the health of white people in the United, of, um, white people in the United States. Um, and most of the increase in mortality is occurring as a result of poisoning, like alcohol poisoning. Um, it's occurring as a result of suicide and drug addiction. And so this is, really, this is really pointing to a social problem. We have some pretty good models in the world of how to solve the problem of inequality. Um, you've made um, your way ahead of us on that. The Scandinavian countries are probably ahead of um, everyone. And the, I think these models tell us that, the, the, uh, that solving the problem of inequality involves a very wide range of policies that span the space between economics, like for example a progressive tax and a safety net, but also sociology, norms regarding wage differentials, and psychology, um, notions of fairness in the society. So I, I don't know if I'm going to prevail with my daughter. I, I suspect that I probably won't, and she will end up applying to um, engineering um, programs. However, I'm, I'm still holding my trump card. Um, when it comes to persuading her. And um, one, thing, um, one thing I noticed when I changed um, fields from computer science to economics was that the conversation at parties, the, the parties got better and the conversation at the parties got a whole lot more interesting. When I was in computer science, we would talk about things like um, oper operating systems and like, I don't know, code and stuff like that. And you run out of conversation awfully quickly when that's what you have to talk about. And the, the topics of conversation at parties populated by um, social scientists and psychologists are so much more interesting in my view. And that, um, that's the trump card I'm holding out with her. Um, in any case, it's a thrill for me to um, get this degree from a university that specializes in the um, social and behavioral sciences. And uh, Marcel, thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. I think, I, I think it was either in Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn that um, the protagonist, um, they think that he's died in the cave and, he go, and um, they, they're having a funeral for him and, and um, he listens to eulogies told about him. And, um, but this is a whole lot better. Um, <laughs> um, uh, get, you get to hear the equivalent of a eulogy while you're still alive. So, yeah, thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure.
We now, ladies and gentlemen, proceed to the second honorary doctorate. On the recommendation of the Dean of the Tilburg Law School, the Doctorate Board of Tilburg University has decided in its meeting of May 10th to confer the degree of Dr. Honoris Causa on Benedict William Kingsbury for his exceptional achievements in global law. I invite Professor Anne Meeuwissen to make known the state on what grounds this decision has been based and I authorize her to invest Benedict William Kingsbury with this dignity. Please go ahead. Mr. Rector Magnificus, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kingsbury, what makes someone with a distinguished career as a law professor stand out in such a way that the title of honorary doctor is bestowed upon him or her? And what is a Tilburg University honorary doctor made of specifically? Leiden born, New Zealand bred, Oxford educated, and now the Murray and Ida Becker Professor of Law <clears throat> and Director of the Institute for International Law and Justice at New York University School of Law. In your case, esteemed colleague, your special achievements can be illustrated through a set of roles that you have fulfilled and still fulfilled. Roles that are not necessarily in a standard law professor's job description, certainly not united in one person, but which represent values that Tilburg University holds dear. And these roles are those of pioneer, public intellectual, and historian. Both through your own work and through the fostering and facilitating of the work of others, you have been at the roots of many debates and developments in public law worldwide over the last two decades. We now tend to take the inter interconnectedness of national and international public law as a given, but it had to be unveiled first, and your research was of a pioneering nature in that respect. An important example of your normative contribution to public law scholarship is your classic piece on the principle of sovereign equality, crucial in protecting weak states. Your interest in inclusion shows in your work for instance, in your significant contribution to the early critical work on indigenous peoples. A true innovator in legal education, long before people started calling themselves innovators, and which is why I prefer the word pioneer, your career is marked by constant support for young scholars and new ideas. As one of the founding fathers of NYU Global Law School, you acted as an agenda setter for the law, law and globalization idea, Tilburg Law School is strongly committed to as well. You've also contributed greatly to the personal side of building a global law community by making people feel welcome there and heard. And although your name is forever tied to the Global Administrative Law Project, in fact, that project title belies the fact that many of the insights your research produced are related to the cross-sectoral nature of global law. One of the defining characteristics your work helped uncover is that, for instance, environmental regulation nowadays, to a large degree, comes from more generic regulatory bodies, such as the World Bank, the OECD, the WTO, and potentially from MIGA regional trade agreements, such as TPP and TTIP, as discussed in the Global Law Lab you held yesterday. On to the second role, that of public intellectual, which is perhaps not the first thing that springs to mind with regard to someone whose two latest books are about a phenomenon called indicators. These sort of, sorts of debates may sound silly or esoteric, you explained in the Wall Street Journal, on that occasion referring specifically to the practice of country ranking at the Olympics. But they have great potential for shaping normative commitments around the world. The title of one of these two books is illustrative in this respect. The Quiet Power of Indicators, Measuring Governance, Corruption, and Rule of Law. Quiet power is indeed an important theme in your work and career. 
the importance of your work for societies at large only increases if we take into account that traditional international cooperation mechanisms are under threat and that the rise of big data comes with further threats and new opportunities, also for governance by indicators. States may choose to withdraw from the international, but will still be permeated by the global. The third role, that of historian, perhaps at first sight is the most obvious of the three, since you actually have an impressive track record as a legal historian as well. You've been the driving force behind the turn to history in the study of international law in the Anglo-American world and beyond. Here, the pioneer surfaces again, as another achievement concerns the widening of the classical canon of history of international law, so as to include, for instance, Gentilly's lesser known work. You were also one of the first to rediscover Grotius. But your role as historian is broader. It is about the all important contextualization of a variety of world events to which law in many guises is trying to respond. It is about the ability to connect the dots between localized practices and global problems like climate change through a variety of complex legal subdisciplines in a non-static manner. It is about seeing a trade agreements not as just a negotiation, but as a form of governance. Seeing a highly specialized and somewhat obscure private regulator, not just as a technical fact of life, but as an incubator for global legal change. About seeing legal education as much more than a service to legal practice. And about seeing legal research as a broad intellectual imperative. In an interview, you have said that as a young student, you saw and were inspired by the things you could do with international law. Certainly, if we replace international law with global law, it has become clear during your visit to our campus these days that you still believe that. Perhaps it has become more ungrateful work. Work that needs to take place as part of ever more mundane activities that in the end make up the global. This means that the kind of inclusive, sharp, and contextual thinking you and your work stand for are not intellectual luxuries. Today, we need pioneers, public intellectuals, and historians. And therefore, as you have led by eminent example on all three fronts, Tilburg University is proud to count you, Ben Dick Kingsbury, almost among her honorary doctors. I invite the Beadle to escort Professor Kingsbury forward. By virtue of the authority granted to us by law and the regulations of the university, in accordance with the decision by the doctorate board of Tilburg University, I hereby promote you, Ben Dick Kingsbury, to Doctor Honoris Causa and bestow upon you all the rights that by law or custom are or will be attached to the doctorate. In evidence, I clothe you with the kappa of Tilburg University and hand you the certificate signed by the Rector Magnificus and the Honorary Doctorate Supervisor and reaffirmed by the seal of the university.
So I wonder if I can keep uh, time with the music. I, I uh, <laughs> b- believe a lot in rhythm, actually, in life and in scholarship. So, <laughs> but uh, that's a faster rhythm than I've ever lived. So, uh, Rector Magnificus, uh, deans, ex-deans, who are probably a lot happier than the deans. Uh, uh, Anna, for that uh, wonderfully generous promotional address, which uh, sees much more in my work and both uh, depth and uh, perceptiveness and value than anyone uh, could really find there in a less charitable, ordinary light, uh, but I'm touched by it. Uh, students who are here, the staff and the distinguished guests of Silberg University, uh, it's a deep honor, and uh, I'm profoundly touched in person uh, that such a pioneering uh, and forward-looking university as Tilburg has thought fit to bring me into its circle of graduates. Graduating with an honorary degree uh, seems rather scandalous uh, when I look out and see the students uh, and the graduates who've actually earned their degrees uh, and all the work they've done to do it. On the other hand, uh, I think as Professor Dr. Minister Berlin has already told us, the fact of not having done anything to earn the degree does intensify the responsibility to do something afterwards. Uh, and uh, So I share that feeling that that's what one joins in this. That for me, uh, as an honor and it's my first visit, and it's really meant this wonderful occasion to come to Tilburg, and I certainly hope there'll be many more. Tilburg Law School has long been recognized as a European leader in the whole set of areas in which I work and which Anna sketched out. And here it's been given the name Global Law, which can sound a bit like a fashionable slogan, and there are many places in the world who now profess global law, but it's really just uh, window dressing for what they have been doing for 100 years or however long they've lumbered on. Tilburg is not like that. Uh, Tilburg is a place which has seriously thought about the development of an intellectual program, uh, a program of substantial training for students in a now indeed a dedicated uh, degree in global law, which is only recently began with a small number of students and is now this year 90 in the new class. And those people have come, of course, partly from the subject matter and the innovation it involves, uh, but substantially because Tilburg really delivers on something special and different uh, in that branch of legal thinking and practice. So we gathered, and I'm really pleased to join, in a place where uh, global law is seriously studied. It is uh, very rich and interesting research, I'll mention, and a substantial body of students who are now not lumbering into this or lurching or serendipitously arriving like most of us, but who are trained there and are going to have a structure going out, uh, which has been rare. So the, 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 coming here, I meet many people whose papers I've read over the years without knowing in person and a few old friends, uh, but some of these areas of work really tie very much to other things that are going on in the university and that have been discussed already in this whole session this afternoon. Uh, and we try to bring to these things the legal dimensions in a way which is really integrated, interdisciplinary sometimes we say, or at least cross-disciplinary, and where Tilburg I see is doing a lot of nurturing of that cross-disciplinary possibilities. Uh, so there's been a substantial discussion of an area that I've also worked in, of uh, data, big data, indicators, rankings, what we've tried to call governance by information, uh, and the rapidity of information processing, uh, also the uh, visualization, the heuristics, the techniques for putting it into people's minds, and in doing that, from putting out other things that could have been in there for the creation of these ontological categories and new kinds of epistemology which displace other kinds. Uh, we've studied that partly in the science and technology studies frame, partly in the Foucault power and counter power, uh, knowledge's power frame, uh, trying to see that the way in which indicators and rankings really function like law, like legal rules. That is, they have in them a vision of the ideal, what should be, what could be the perfect, and of the steps you'd have to take to get there 
and every dean and ex-dean at least has no doubt been obsessed with some sets of rankings, uh, and our work is a kind of critique of that, but a critique of, it doesn't mean there's a solution to that. We need simplifications and heuristics, but we need contestation, and multiplicity, and, and the possibility of steering and choosing, not just being governed completely by someone else over whom you have no control. And our work has really tried to push, recognizing that indicators and rankings work like law, they set standards, that they should be challengeable in the way that administrative law is challengeable. There should be things you can do about them. They should have to defend themselves, have reasons, accountability mechanisms. That's the kind of arguments we've made from the global administrative law and regulatory uh, uh, backdrop towards something which don't look like law at all and what most lawyers would not see anything there to do. You just feel powerless in the face of information in the way you wouldn't feel powerless in the face of a rule from the Tilburg municipality or the Netherlands or the European Commission or the Security Council of the UN. All of those you can do something and indicators we have felt powerless and it's a misplaced feeling. And I think that illustrates the dimension of governance, regulation, organization of contestation, counterpower, rights protection, which has to be built into all these new forms of power and governance yeah, and especially the ones that, that I study, that many people in Tilburg study, the power which is beyond the state in some way, which in this for lawyers is a big challenge, uh, and it's what defines this global law enterprise, trying to move away from the premise that if the state has done it in an orderly, promulgated, often textual fashion with courts, then that's law, and if the state hasn't done it, then it probably isn't really law. It may be interesting and important, but it's something else. And we really tried, and the global law enterprise here very much tries, to bring much more into the field of law. And of course, it's, it's, it's intellectually a challenge, uh, and it's sociologically for lawyers who've got the stamp, the imprimatur, or the license to practice in the court, the old recognition, there's an anxiety that the, all this enterprise is too unmoored from that. That you may be something, but you're not really a lawyer. You're not really doing law there. And the, the, the vital step is the transformation to say, yes, law is about the organization, regularization, legitimation, and control of power. And where power is happening in those ways, the, the techniques of law and lawyering should be there. And both to organize the power, to make it better, make it more effective, uh, cheaper, and also to control it and deal with the other values that have to be there. And that's, I think, the big picture of what global law is it about. And the way I try to describe it there, it's not easy to do. Uh, even though it sounds important. And so uh, that's the enterprise, and indicators is one element of that. Uh, several have been mentioned. I think uh, we've very active work here in Tilburg on private standard setting, uh, which could be forestry, regulation, uh, <coughs> regulation of forest products. Uh, it could be climate accounting, measurement of emissions. Uh, it could be uh, the, the power which is set used by Google to decide on who's forgotten and who's not forgotten or what the algorithms are going to be uh, that uh, determine what you get to see, uh, power of Facebook and so forth. So that whole body of private rulemaking, private decisions, we'll take this off the Facebook, we won't take that off, all made in these closed, very highly resourced worlds, uh, starts off inaccessible to law because if you don't have the state mobilized, you don't have a straight out structure for what you're gonna do about it. And the global law enterprise is about trying to think into the structures of rules and the ways of reasoning and the forms of organized review mechanism, the systems of accountability that have to be there, but often they have to be there without the state. And I think we see in so much of what's been talked about today, uh, D data, data governance, um, uh, uh, climate, uh, economic flows, uh, that although we can talk about it in terms of uh, situated in a place, and as was talked about, in a society, well, there's a society which has values, it's around us, we, that we can try to work those values into these things and vice versa. Once we go beyond a state, beyond any country, uh, in the way that all these things do, forestry standards and the uh, Facebook and Google and the indicators, uh, that w w we don't have that confidence of where the values are gonna come from that will decide. We don't have agreement on the values that ought to be applied there. And the, the core location of the power is not really where the power is felt. So, so the reach is mismatched. The mechanisms are mismatched. Uh, there's no straight out 
tracking structure once you move outside the state. Uh, and, and all these things do that. And the effort of global law is to catch the law and the institutions up with the forms of power and its fluidity and its reconstruction. Uh, and that, that, that's uh, to find ways to gradually build enough, if not of substantive values, which are very hard to agree on, but at least of process and procedures and regularization. Uh, and and uh, that's what global municipal law has been about and many other people's work. So that's to try to give a flavor, I think, of uh, what, what the global law enterprise has to struggle with and uh, why it can be so important. Now, having tried to introduce that, I thought we could, could be useful for a moment to step back. Instead of talking about global law, but talk about the people who do it. Uh, and that was what we might call the global jurists. And it, it's, it's perhaps an occasion to reflect for a moment, what does it mean to be a global jurist? And historically, a lot of them have been liminal figures. Uh, people who have migrated, often been displaced from one place to another. And if we can think back to the earliest ones I've worked on, Alberico Gentili, was born in 1552 in Italy, but he was a Protestant, and eventually when the Inquisition arrived, he fled just ahead of them, and ended up in Oxford professing civil law because that was the portable currency. You didn't have to be local to do civil law. And he started to write then about the new world he could see as the feudal system was collapsing, as the Reformation had broken up the papal power, as the Holy Roman Empire was not really gonna be a dominant force. What, what are going to be the principles for organizing that politics? Organizing its violence, uh, its, its wars, its post-war settlements, its, its uh, principles for, uh, for who should have what and why. What were going to be the ways of doing it? And his enterprise as an early global lawyer then, a displaced one, uh, was to look back to Roman law and say, you know, we have a resource here uh, and we can constructed this new international politics, which he could just begin to see is happening. We can construct that by using the language of law. And we're gonna use Roman law, rights and remedies, uh, ways of defining who has what, where a boundary is, what happens after a war, if someone's took the property, do you have to give it back? All these things which are causes of war could be regularized and made more accepted, the solutions, by referring to a legal language rather than just politics, uh, or in the cruder way they barely had then, just economics. So. That's an early global lawyer, and he had a resource. Roman law, he could appeal to because it was sophisticated, it was widely known, it was really venerated, it was ancient, and it had happened in the same places as the new law had to be. That is, the, for him, the, where the Roman Empire was, was where international law from Roman law would be. It's this curious thing, it completely collapses time. A thousand years have gone in between. It doesn't matter to him, the time is gone. He just collapses it. Uh, but, and he thinks he is something which will be accepted, convincing, legitimate, and even though we couldn't now produce it, we've got it, so we're gonna make this into the new international law. So that was his global law, lawyering as a global jurist. Uh, what do we see now, though, is in a way harder. Um, it, it, so when we think of the world now and the problems of the climate change, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of TTIP, of nuclear weapons, uh, and of governance of private nuclear facilities, thousands and thousands of things, those set of problems. When we think of them, uh, we have to reach all over the world. And there are tremendous gradients of power there. The, 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 the few people in the North Atlantic so far have been governing a lot of other people, largely. Uh, and there's tremendous uh, disparities of uh, capacity, but also of reach and value. So, uh, and no one, th there is no equivalent Roman law, really because those places weren't all in the same system. They haven't all been learning it for a long time and can recuperate it. It needs something else and something new. And in some ways a more inclusive process, and it's really all about the processes which enable it to form and to be challenged uh, and contested. Uh, so, so when one is now a global jurist, one is trying to contribute to that by happenstance and serendipity of migrants, uh, and you want a lot of those, but in a situated way, in, in a particular society, which then reaches out and out from Tilburg, to the Netherlands, to Europe, to, uh, to the world, but shares with those things. Um, and, and, and as that happens, how is it being done? Well, I think it, it, you might say a lot of things are gonna be done by economists, by the sort of superb uh, perceptive work of behavioral economics and uh, so, uh, that kind of social science by data. But what does law bring in addition to that? What is the jurist part of being global? And here I think we see three things, and it's 
and some shared kind of commitment. First, I think there's some amount of vision, that there's something we're aiming for here. And uh, second, uh, and it's a big vision, it can be a big vision. Second is the capacity of critique. We can challenge power, we can look to history, we can push in another direction. Uh, we don't just accept and report and study and, and observe, we do. Uh, and that's, I think, goes with the idea that it's really a world of our own making. And that's what we're teaching our, that's what we're teaching the students, that's what it means to be a global lawyer. You don't just live in it, you make it. Uh, and you have to have that mentality because the problems are hard, they're urgent and they're not addressed. And finally, and this is the last point here, uh, we, we bring, I think, this idea of, that, that, that if you do law, you do a lot of things at once. It's not a price in the market. It's not just an instrumental calculus, an incentive to shift this or that. It, you, you buy into a lot of things. You buy into rationality, uh, yes, um, legality, of course, equality of, between the parties at least, proportionality, basic rights, and at the end, a kind of publicness. And this, this has really been my, my own work, that law uh, is not just transactional. It's not just to, to, to simplify movements of things. That law is uh, the whole of a society, the whole of a community of interest uh, speaking, and they're speaking to all of it. They have to take account of all the interests there. Of course, they won't all win. You have to compensate losers, but they've all got to be in part of the process. And that idea of publicness is built into law, I think, and it's what I hope our global jurists of the future are going to live and be. So it's an honor to be in a place which so much celebrates and carries forward that work, and I'm very pleased to have this chance to join its community. For the final part, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it uh, gives us great pleasure to announce this year's winner of the uh, Tilburg University Doctoral Dissertation Prize Award. We had some over 160 PhD theses over the last year, and uh, the competition was tough. The winner, ladies and gentlemen, of this year's dissertation prize is Marike Hoetjens. Marike, can I invite you? We first have an interview. <laughs> At least. Hi, Marike. Congratulations. Marike, the, the, the title of your thesis was Talking hands. And uh, you studied the effect of repetition, repetition in speech and repetition in gestures. And as we know from speech that uh, if people repeat words, then they are less well pronounced if they repeat them later on. Um, does the same hold for gestures? Well, what I found in my, uh, in my dissertation is that um, when people communicate, they, uh, you know, they produce speech and they produce uh, gestures. And um, um, and when speech changes, uh, gestures also change, and also in similar ways. So, um, for example, um, when people describe a picture more than once, uh, they start to use fewer words and also fewer gestures. So what this really means is that um, gestures are not random movements, but they're really closely tied to speech. Um, yeah, so you could even say that all of us, we all have talking Hands. Yes. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very well. I noticed. Indeed, uh, most of uh, the people um, use their hands to talk. Very good. Very good. So we are going to award the prize, Mr. Beagle. It's an important moment in your career. <laughs> All right then. Congratulations once more. Here you are. Is there anything you would like to say? Because you have the last word today. Yes. Please go ahead. Yes. So, um, um, I've been told um, that I have one minute to say uh, thank you. And, um, uh, yeah, I think trying to do this properly might prove even more difficult than um, writing the actual thesis. Um, but I'll give it a try. 
And so I'm really um, extremely happy to be awarded uh, this prize. Some people say that writing a thesis is um, something that you do uh, alone. But I can honestly say that I really couldn't have finished my thesis uh, without the support of all my friends uh, and colleagues at the Department of Communication and Information Sciences. Um, I've been away from Tilburg University for just over a year now. Uh, and one of the first things that I thought when I heard I would be given this prize was, you know, yes, I get to go back and see everyone again. Um, it really, it truly really was a wonderful place uh, to work at. And the fact that I look back at my time at Tilburg University with such warm feelings um, is really largely caused by my uh, PhD supervisors, Emil Kramer and Mark Swartz, um, who I really cannot thank enough for all their help and support throughout the years. Um, of course, there are really many more people that I would like to thank, and I actually spent several pages of my thesis uh, doing this, but there's no way I, could, I can fit them all in this uh, one minute or one minute and a half. Um, the, only, the only other person that I do want to thank in public is uh, Bas, who knows uh, better than anyone what this prize really means to me. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this ceremony. I hope uh, that you will agree that we have celebrated a number of outstanding persons uh, this afternoon. Um, we will given, be given the opportunity to uh, congratulate them uh, outside. Uh, when we leave the hall, I would like to ask you kindly to give the Cortez the opportunity to leave the uh, auditorium first. And to close the meeting, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to say a little prayer, so please stand up. Maybe we filled with the breath of life, which will guide us towards the wisdom and knowledge to heal that which seems incurable and to accomplish that which seems impossible. Thank you very much.